Welcome back to the Tank Me Later podcast. I am your host, Noah Rubin, and this is episode 58. And for this one, Roto World's Raphael Johnson is going to join me to talk about the Knicks, the Cavs, and the Magic. So let's go ahead and get into it. And quickly, before I bring Raf in, I just want to remind everybody that support for this Fantasy Basketball International podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Shaving your jewels doesn't have to be risky business anymore thanks to the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. This trimmer is all about keeping things smooth and safe so you can trim with confidence. Treat your wrinkle berries and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com to get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FBI20. With Manscaped, it's easy grooming, no surprises. We know every dude gets the heebie-jeebies when it's time for a close shave down under, especially when using the wrong tools. That's precisely why Manscaped is my go-to for those delicate spots. Trust me, this trimmer will be your crown jewel's new best buddy. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FBI20 at manscaped.com. That is 20% off plus free shipping with the code FBI20 at manscaped.com. Show your balls some love and feel free as a dove as i said this is the tank me later podcast and i'm going to be joined right now actually by Raphael johnson from roto world raf how are you doing today I'm doing well um obviously living out in the desert pretty hot um 100, 100 degrees today but yeah other than that you know doing well you you know it's not quite that hot it is pretty hot in south carolina not 100 mm-hmm. degrees hot but man, yeah, that's that's brutal. But it uh, <laughs> not much more you can say about a, that yeah. other than yeah, no, it's it's hot. But um, yeah. So Raph, with these, I've been trying to get fans of teams, fantasy analysts that are also fans of the teams we're talking about because the people who pay attention to the teams the most are the fans. Um, mm-hmm. And you're you're a Cavs fan. I know that that you're a diehard Cavs fan, born and Whoa. raised in Cleveland. Whoa. <laughs> oh, right. oh yeah. now, now, I now i get it now i get it right. so just for just for clarity rap is actually a diehard knicks fan um figured i'd mess with him a little bit but you know we have fun we'll talk about the knicks first because <laughs> that's a little bit more fun and they had the best season of the three teams that we're going to talk about they went 50 and 32. They were the second seed in the East entering the playoffs. Made it to the second round, lost in seven games to the Pacers after beating the Sixers in six games. Um, they have picks 24, 25, and 38, but recent reports slash rumors, whatever you want to call them, kind of suggest that they're going to be trading these picks or looking to trade these picks, see what they can add to their team. Um, but having three picks after the season they had, it's a pretty good spot to be in. For the team direction, I've been kind of doing a team direction for everybody as we go through these. I think they're a true contender. Um, some, of, some of these haven't been that generous with what their team direction is, but I think if the Knicks were healthy that they would have given Boston a run for their money. Um, you know, they don't have the top five player in the league that many contending teams generally have, but they're a well-built team. They all buy into Tibbs' system. Brunson was playing like a top five player for a, for a little while before he got hurt. Raph, how does it feel to be a Knicks fan right now? It feels good. Um, it was a little disappointing how it ended with all the injuries. Um, but I think even if, had they pulled out that game seven against the Pacers, they would have been in a bad spot against the Celtics just because of the lack of bodies. So, you know, 50 wins, I think, you look at what Leon Rose and World Wide West have done with the front office in terms of draft capital and things that affect and also player contracts. This team's in a really good spot. Um, If they wanted to make a a major move, they can do that without really killing the nucleus of the team, or they can kind of stay, stay the course. Um, That can be dangerous though. You know, I think you look at like the Knicks, the Pacers, you know, thinking that, well, if we just get healthy or, or whatnot, will be fine, but other teams are sitting still too. So you always have to take that into effect. But I think the Knicks are in a good spot going into this offseason. 
yeah, as a Hawks fan, I know what it's like to have a really good season and then not do yeah. anything the off season after. And we, we see how that has turned out over the last mm-hmm. few years. Um, but it's fun. Uh, probably more fun to be a Knicks fan than it has been in a really long time. This was the best season yeah. in a while. Um, if we're looking at fantasy perspective for this team, the players, obviously it starts with Jalen Brunson. He was the best mm-hmm. fantasy player this season. Um, a top 30 guy, uh, I remember when we did this last year, I asked you about Jalen Brunson. You're like, no, I think he could be even better this year because he Mm -hmm. had a breakout season his first year with the Knicks, which was kind of not expected him to be that good, but expected him to be better. And he took it another step this past season. So you were correct on that prediction. Do we think that he's going to take another step or is this the player that we're going to see for the next few years? Or was this even like an outlier season? You're expecting some regression next year. I feel like this is what we should expect to see from him moving forward. Um, you know, he finished 16th in nine cat. I don't think we should expect him to go too much higher than that because then you're talking about first round value. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and say that he definitely can't do that, but I don't think that's something that a fantasy manager who's putting together their draft board can expect that type of jump from him. Um, but I think second round, you know, I think that's a pretty safe spot to pick him in drafts for next season. He was outstanding, you know, top five in MVP voting, uh, second team all NBA. Obviously, you got Luca and Shea as a starting as a first team guard, so that was bound to happen. But yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see because he's extension eligible. Um, there were some reports that he would potentially consider taking less this summer as opposed to waiting till next summer. If that happens, great. But I mean, you're talking about potentially 200 million next summer or something to that effect compared to like what 150 now (laughs) like yeah i mean i know what i would do but i'm not jalen brunson you know so yeah we'll see what happens there you've got some big decisions with og and and isaiah hartenstein but you know brunson in terms of his value i think you're looking at second round maybe third because i don't think his game is suited to where there's going to be a significant drop off in production unless he were to suffer a severe injury or something to that effect yeah, and one of the early redraft mocks that both of us have participated in, uh, he mm-hmm. went 28th in that one. So that would be early third round value. Early 12 third, team. This yeah. was 14. This was 14. So he went the last pick of the second round, but that's basically yeah. a third rounder. So mm-hmm. right on par with what you were saying. Um, some of these early, early mocks have been a little bit messy, but he did go right after uh, Trey Young and Damian Lillard. Um, some of the others, uh, you know, Tyrese Maxey went in front of him, Steph went in front of him. I think there's a lot of really good point guards. Like, obviously, that's a thing in the NBA. But also specifically in fantasy, a lot of these point guards are having a lot of success right now. Um, And Brunson is one of those guys, early third round, late second. I think there's definitely an argument. Um, It'd be nice if he played like how he did in the playoffs, but I don't think we're expecting for him to be able to do that over the course of the whole season. That would be pretty unreal, Mm -hmm. but... We've seen him be capable of elite production, and hopefully that's something that he can continue for a few years, uh, make the Knicks fun. The Knicks are yeah. – the NBA is fun when the Knicks are good. Um, mm-hmm. Whether you like the Knicks or hate the Knicks, you know, it's fun when they're good. Yeah. Um, Julius Randle is probably a pretty interesting guy to talk about. Um, one, every other year he does good. Every other year he does bad. Um, obviously that's not – I mean, it has been a pattern. It's not something that he is literally just having a good season then having a bad season like on purpose or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just looking at the last few years, he was outside the top 100 this year, last year inside the top 75, outside the top 100 the year before that, inside the top 40 the year before that. Um, are you expecting him to be better? Actually, even before we get into that, do you think he's going to be a Nick next year? That's a good question. I think in terms of the potential moving pieces, he might be the easiest one to move. Um, Not just contract, but the amount of time that he was out, we kind of saw what a rotation could potentially look like without him, as long as everyone else is relatively healthy. So I think he will be, just because I I think the era of star chasing, the the new cap rules kind of make that extremely difficult to do. And, And if you do it, 
you're looking at what one, maybe two years before you really have to make decisions about the cap space. And that could really do a number on, on your available uh, player base. So I think Julius, he's on a good deal. And they played well when they had him and Ananobi healthy. I think they're like 14 and two or something like that when Ananobi played those first 16 games. So, man, I, because what this Knicks team missed during the playoffs was that second score, and that would have been Julius. So I think you can certainly argue that he's a good fit for this group. Um, obviously, some things will change with the rotation, but I think he'll still be a good fit if he's back. Um, in terms of fantasy, like you mentioned, bit of a roller coaster in terms of where he's ranked, and I think the efficiency has a lot to do with it. Um, average three and a half turnovers per game this season, which is a big reason why he was outside of the top 100. If he can get that closer to three or just under that, and also I think he got off to a slow start in terms of the shooting percentages too. So, um, you know, when those things happen, that kind of puts him behind the eight ball and it's difficult to get back from it. So we'll see. Um, another season in which he's coming off of a surgery, that's something else to watch. I think that's a bit of a concern for fantasy managers. I don't think you let him slip outside of the top 100 in terms of where you're drafting him, but you're not going to use like a fifth or sixth round pick on him. I don't think, I think seventh or eighth would probably be a good place to kind of target him in drafts. Yeah, I think that's fair. Cause I mean, it's probably a little higher in points leagues that, but in category leagues, yeah. mm -hmm. um, he's been pretty much, I mean, last four years, he's a little under 10 rebounds per game this year, but yeah. 20 point double, double most of those years, at least 24 points, four or five assists. Even he had a, the year where he had six assists per game. The defensive numbers aren't there. Like you mentioned, the percentages aren't great, but that that'll play with, with the mm -hmm. right build. Like you can't <laughs> 25 and 10 and five is, yeah, you know, exactly. that, that'll mm -hmm. play in, in uh, fantasy basketball. Um, what do you think as whether it's from a fan perspective or fantasy perspective, there's probably more just rumors, maybe even just speculation of a Julius Randle, Mikhail Bridges swap, get all the Villanova guys back together. Um, is that something you, you're you shaking your head? Is that something you'd be interested in or you just don't see happening or what? I don't see it happening just because I feel like that would be too much to give up for Mikhail. Um, very good player, don't get me wrong, but when you're talking about the need for that consistent score next to Jalen Brunson, I don't know if Bridges can be that guy. Um he was a far different situation with Brooklyn this year. They effectively started out with him as like their number one scoring option. That didn't work. I think he's better as a supplementary piece, but what the Knicks would need if they were to move Julius Randle would be something in between those two roles. And I don't know if Mikhail would be the guy for that. Now they improved significantly defensively with him, but that also puts even more pressure on you to re-sign OG and Anobi because now you're looking at a spot where Who's going to play the four? And they get significantly smaller with that type of lineup with Mikhail and OG. So I, I don't like that straight up. Personally, it, yeah, I think they would. the Knicks would have to give up a little too much for that, to be honest with you. And and I don't think that will be a good move for them. Yeah, no, that's fair. I think it's maybe it's just the nostalgia of getting the, the yeah. Villanova guys all on one team. I think that would Nos be – Yeah, nostalgia yeah. aside, I don't think <laughs> – <laughs> I don't think that would be great. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned OG. His numbers were down even before he was traded to the Knicks. Mm -hmm. um, I think the numbers still were down after the trade because he was changing his role a little bit, adjusting yeah. to a new situation. Injured a good bit this year. I mean, what do we expect from him? I mean, there, it's still up in the air whether or not he even resigns, but assuming mm -hmm. he's back at work, what do we kind of expect from him next year? You know, I think he has top 50 potential. We've seen him do that in the past. Um, most recently, 21-22, finished out just outside the top 50. Season prior, he was a top 35 player. So I think there's certainly that potential, especially you get a full off season in a training camp working with these guys. Um, one of the best corner three-point shooters in the NBA. He wouldn't have to be a marquee scoring option. Um in terms of you know isolation plays and whatnot, but he can get you to catch and shoots or drive drive on the closeouts. And then defensively, we've seen his work. Um, he's going to give you at least two combined blocks and steals per game, if not more. So I think he has top 50 potential. 
um, and we've seen him get drafted that high in the past, I would not be opposed to someone, someone taking him off the board at that point, to be honest with you. Yeah, and I think just looking at the numbers, the main reason for the drop is a little bit the free throw percentage yeah. uh, drop mm-hmm. a little bit, but he's only take he's taking less than two per game, not really changing all that much, but the steals dipped. I mean, it was 1.9 last year, and it was less than one and a half this past season. Yeah. It's Even though that's still a pretty solid number, that drop ends up affecting his value a good bit, but just with steals being volatile, I don't see why he would be able to get back up especially with how much Tibbs will probably have him on the floor. I do wonder how much of that was impacted by the change in coaches up in Toronto. Mm. You think about it last season, he averaged 1.9 steals per game under Nick nurse. They went to a different sit- different system, not as much switching, not as aggressive on the perimeter. One steal per game in Toronto, got that up to 1.7 with the Knicks. So I do wonder if that was a matter of, um, you know, personnel slash um, defensive approach more than anything on his part in terms of the decrease in production. Yeah, you know, that's a good point because I think the same exact thing happened with Gary Trent Jr. Because he was a yeah. guy that was pretty consistent with the steals and they fell off a cliff this year. And even mm-hmm. Fred Van Vliet was really good with the steals in this past year. I think it ended up being down because he was just getting credited for more blocks on swipe downs than on steals. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. the numbers were still down, not playing for Fred or uh, for Nick Nurse, not not Coach Fred Van Lee, Coach Nick Nurse. Mm-hmm. Um, Josh Hart was obviously really really good in the playoffs, but he's not going to be playing forty eight minutes per game during the regular season. And I would say that he's probably going to be playing off the bench if everybody's healthy yeah. again. Even if he was as impactful as he was during the playoffs. Um, I don't know. Kind of similar question. OG, what do we expect from Josh Hart next year, barring major roster changes that would open up a starting spot for him? But if he's in a reserve role, he's probably just a guy you want in the later rounds. Yeah, I think he's a late round guy. Like Even if he comes off the bench, you know he's going to play at least high 20s in terms of minutes. Um, his first his first season with the Knicks after the trade, he averaged – he averaged, let me see here, pull it up here. He averaged 30 minutes per game off the bench and played 33.4 this season. So playing time's not going to be an issue for him. I think the one thing you're kind of keeping an eye on is the perimeter shot. Um, he hurt his wrist late in the season, got that right, and was a bit more willing to take those shots you know, down the stretch. He said he was going to work with J.J. Redick, but I do kind of wonder with J.J. Redick, the recent rumors – Will J.J. Redick be able to train him this summer? You know, so I think that's right. something that either way he's going to work at it. You know, he gives you a lot in terms of the rebounding defensive stats, um, some playmaking. The turnovers can be a bit high at times, but I think Josh Hart's going to be a pretty safe late round pick in standard league drafts. Yeah. And obviously that's still enough time for him to make an impact. Um, yeah. He's like not a big scorer, but a very good rebounder and mm-hmm. will get you a handful of assists, maybe a, a steal out per game, uh, which is pretty close with what he had this season. As far as the center room with the Knicks, you know, you have or this year it was Isaiah Hardenstein and then Mitch Robinson when he was healthy. And then, you know, there were sprinkles of precious Sachua when they were really, really injured and Jericho Sims. But uh, are you expecting Isaiah Hardenstein to be back with the Knicks? Or are you expecting him to have played well enough to get a pretty big payday elsewhere? I think he's played well enough to get a good payday. Um, the question is, will the chemistry that he has with the Knicks, like he and Mitchell Robinson are extremely close um, and good good relationships with the entire roster, will that be enough to kind of offset, you know, the, the money that he would potentially have to give up? I think the Knicks, the most they can pay him annually is about $16 million. Now, You go to Oklahoma City, Orlando, places like that that have also come up. They can afford to pay him a bit more in free agency. So I think that's going to be the question. Um, And if he returns, I strongly believe he should be the starter. Um, What he brings to the table in terms of that, the the pick and roll game, he can make plays out of the short roll, the floater. I think he shot like 70-something percent on floaters. I, I don't know the exact number, but very high conversion rate there. And he was a bit underrated as a rim protector. Now, he may not be the explosive athlete that Mitchell Robinson is, but given Mitchell's medical history, 
Yeah, I think that's a situation where you're the Knicks. I think OG is a clear priority in terms of exp- uh, pending free agents, but Hartenstein is going to be important for them as well because you want that tandem. Like we've seen Dallas get to the NBA Finals with a really good center tandem. So I think the Knicks are going to try to do something similar if they can here. Yeah, and if it ends up being kind of a minute split where whether it's 24-24, 26-22, like whatever it might be, if Hartenstein is the starter, are both guys standard league, like 12-team, nine-cat options? Or would that kind of maybe limit Mitch Robinson's minutes to the point where, you know, maybe he isn't a guy to roster, even if he is as good as he has been? I think he could still be worth rostering um, just because of what you get offensive rebounding. One of the best in the league in that area, Um, the field goal percentage. Now he's not going to be a high volume guy in terms of shot attempts, but he will get opportunities around the basket. The one concern with him is the free throw percentage. Like, you know, that you aren't, you know, if you draft Mr. Robinson late, I think you're a better spot. It's not like you're talking about, an elite center who shoots poorly from the foul line. Cause then you draft them. You're talking about a free throw punt in terms of your roster build. You may be able to get away with it. Mitchell Robinson is a late round pick. So I think he would still have value in standard leagues. He would take a hit, but maybe playing 22 to 24 minutes per game would, would help preserve him. And from an injury standpoint, if anything. Yeah. And that's a pretty, like you mentioned, Dallas has two really good centers. I mean, Boston has two really good centers as well, even though it's probably a little bit of a different situation. Um, Having two centers is great. The Knicks will be good either way, even if it Mm -hmm. ends up just being Mitch Robinson because Hardenstein does sign elsewhere. Um, The last guy that we have to talk about with the Knicks is Dante DiVincenzo, who had an incredible season and arguably even better postseason, kind of like everybody else on the team. Uh, stepped up his team or stepped up his play for the playoffs. Are we expecting this? Just this is who Dante DiVincenzo is like a top 75 guy. Is like that what we should be expecting yeah. moving forward? Um, or is this kind of an outlier? I think it's an outlier. Um, now, but I, I also want to say that he may be the one who could potentially be impacted the most by a trade for like a wing score. Because he's the one who largely had to take on that role once they traded R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel quickly uh, to Toronto for Ananobi. So if he's in there as the starter, you know, maybe a seventh, eighth round pick it would be justified. But I think that's one of those things where it kind of depends on what the Knicks do. If they trade any, if they trade someone and try to get another wing scorer in there, a high level wing then he's someone who would probably drop to the bench and end up being like a late round guy, if anything. So I think right now as currently constructed, he would be a middle round pick like seventh, eighth round. But like I said, he may be the one who's most impacted by what they do during the summer here. Yeah. Which makes, makes sense entirely. I mean, he was never a top hundred guy. Then all of a sudden it's three and a half threes (laughs) per game while shooting 40% from three. Like, He's an elite shooter, like I would say, yeah. like, no, no doubt about it. But that's that's a big step up for him. Um, mm-hmm. it'd be, I'm sure you'd love to see him keep doing that, but we have to be a little bit realistic here. Yeah. Maybe just three threes per game. Maybe just three, but <laughs> that'll that'll still play pretty well. Mm-hmm. All right, we will move on to talking about the Cavs, who went 48 and 34 this year. Um, they lost in the second round. Uh, after finishing fourth in the East, they beat the Magic in seven games in the first round before losing in five to Boston. Uh, played that entire series without Jared Allen. Played the last two games, I believe, without Donovan Mitchell. Um, they have the 20th pick in this draft. Um, and for their team direction, I said they're a contending team on paper. I don't think that they've – they haven't proven that they are, but I think yeah. maybe maybe – Maybe on my paper, maybe the idea of the Cavs are, mm-hmm. hey, they, they have this star young point guard in Darius Garland, this star young big in Evan Mobley, and then, mm-hmm. you know, another all star in Jared Allen. And obviously the face of the franchise, Donovan Mitchell. You know, they have Max Struess, they have Isaac Okoro. Like they have like some solid rotation pieces. Like, hey, like this thing should work. It just hasn't. And there is an argument to be made that it would have worked had they not had the injuries that they had and had they not 
played Boston in the mm -hmm. uh, second round, maybe they would have been in the Eastern Conference Finals. Like I keep bringing this up on podcasts, how it was, you know, the Cavs went 48 and 34, and then the Pacers were 47 and 35. Had the yeah. Cavs been the sixth seed, faced the injured Bucks, and then if they were to beat the Knicks in the second round, they'd be in the Conference Finals. JB Bakerstaff still has a job. So it's you know it's it's interesting how all those things work, but yeah. how do you kind of feel about this Cavs team? Because you didn't, based on your face, it didn't seem like you were on board with them being a contender on paper. Yeah, I, I think the idea of the Cavaliers outweighs the reality because um, yeah. there are still awkward fits there. Whether you talk about between Mitchell and Garland on the perimeter, or Mobley and Allen in the front court, um, they tried to address the, the perimeter shooting deficiencies this past off season. You add guys like Max Struess, George Niang. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like first and foremost, they have to hire a coach. And second, it seems like I don't think they're going to ask Donovan Mitchell explicitly who should we hire as head coach, but making sure they retain him is like a huge part of their off season here. So yeah, I don't know. Like besides him, I think he's clearly like that one lock fantasy option. You know, you're thinking potential first round pick in standard leagues. Evan Mobley, I think his ceiling is lowered by the fact that he played, he shares the floor with Jared Allen. Um, he's capable of stepping out on a perimeter, but as we saw in the playoffs when Allen was off the floor, Mobley was at his best when he was the one big on the floor, able to roam around and protect the basket a bit more than, than, than he would as the four. So, They've got to figure that out. Um, you, regard, depending on who you read, it might be a case of Garland wanting out of Cleveland if Mitchell gets re-signed just because he wants to have the ball, which you understand of a point guard. But I don't know. We'll see what happens there. But, man, there is just too many question marks for this team for me to buy into them being a contender right now, to be honest with you. They have to figure out everything. Like, there's, yeah. there's nothing that feels <laughs> safe. Or secure, yeah. other than maybe, and actually, I could be wrong if I'm just if I haven't checked the contracts and Karis Levert's a free agent, but the Karis Levert's gonna be the sixth man again next year. Probably feels like the only guarantee. Um, yeah. Which, if he's a free agent, then I don't know what to tell you. Everything could look different in Cleveland next year. Um, like you said, they have to hire a coach. Um, they have to figure out what they're doing with their big four. I mean, as soon as they lost, I like within definitely within a few days, but. It felt like within an hour there was rumors regarding all four of their main players. Like, mm -hmm. oh, like Darius Garland's going to ask out if they re-sign Donovan Mitchell. Who knows what Donovan Mitchell's going to do? Is he going to be upset now? Uh, you know, Jared Allen and the team wasn't happy with him and and him not playing through his injury, which we saw that kind of backed up by Marcus Morris going on. I forget which show and talking about that as well, saying it's something he would have played through. Which I mean, okay. I <laughs> I get it, but on the flip side, I think I forget who wrote it, but his concern was the painkiller, the pain injection mm -hmm. that he would have had to take. And yeah. you think back to what happened with Tyrod Taylor, where they punctured his lung. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that came up. It's like I'm not going to tell someone else how they should handle their, their, you know, their body and whether or not they should get a shot or anything like that. So. It's tough. You know, you hear all the, you see all these different things leaking out of Cleveland. And it's quite clear that, that Kobe Altman's got some stuff to clean up this summer. Yeah. Cause even on top of that, it was maybe Evan Mobley is going to be not happy if they keep Jared Allen. And I think He's that may have just been one eligible. Board, but yeah. Yeah. And frankly, the upside of the guy you drafted with the number three overall pick a few years ago is probably mm -hmm. it's higher than what Jared Allen has, even if he yeah. is an all star. Um, and then, yeah, the head coach, I mean, there was also Brian Windhorst said that Donovan Mitchell has similar control in the front office to what LeBron has, if not more. What? Um, that's what Brian Windhorst said. <laughs> so right. when you when you made the point <laughs> about, you know, I don't think Donovan Mitchell is going to be directly involved in getting a coach, like he might be. They might say, hey, who do you want to be the head coach? We'll just name three guys. We'll interview them, and we'll we'll decide together. Maybe they'll let them yeah. sit in on interviews. It's probably not that that far, but that would be pretty funny if they had Donovan mm -hmm. Mitchell running interviews for the coach. But um, for fantasy, under the assumption that Donovan Mitchell is going to be back, um, you know, I guess it's not a guarantee, but 
feels like it is, especially if what Brian Windhorst is saying and he just he has control in the organization. Yeah. Um he just had the best fantasy season of his career. Um are we expecting him to just continue to be this good? And you know, is he a guy that deserves consideration for a first round pick in redraft leagues next year? I think so. I don't know if I would go so far as to take him with like a top 10 pick, but you know, right outside of that or that, that round one slash two turn would be a good spot for him. Um, if he's resigned and it's, made clear that he's the marquee option for that team on the perimeter. So you also, you know, if that happens, you're also wondering what happens with Darius Garland. Like, do they try to make that partnership work for another season or they try to move him um, right now Um, between Mitchell and and Evan Mobley and having to pay those guys, you know, like I agree with you and you said that Mobley offers a higher upside than Allen. So he should be the priority there between those two and and what you're going to have to pay to retain them. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Garland were the one moved. And if that happens, then you're probably talking about Mitchell as a top 10 player if he's the primary point guard in addition to that primary scoring guard. Yeah, and, and looking at this early mock, you actually took him exactly at 10th. So maybe you're banking on uh, Darius Garland being shipped out of there, which is very possible. I know that there was already rumors that the Spurs could be interested, which, you know, we'll see. Um would make sense for them to bring in a point guard and hopefully that can help him bounce back. I'm pretty confident that Donovan Mitchell is going to continue to be at least a first round value in nine cat leagues. Mm -hmm. And then it's just up to you how you want to build your team, um, whether or not you take him there. But I think, you know, really it was a jump in like a slight jump in steals that kind of resulted in and a career high, I believe in assists um, that kind of got him to, what he was this year. Um, yeah. But for Garland, it was a bad season. Like it was the best season for Donovan Mitchell's to like, not the worst season for Darius Garland. His, his rookie year was bad, but uh, finished outside the top hundred. Um, mm-hmm. Efficiency was like the shooting percentages were bad. Obviously the usage was down because the usage for Donovan Mitchell was up. Do we, are you just kind of thinking, Hey, he, at this point, he probably just needs to, a fresh start and that'll be good for him. Like he can get back to being a top 50 fantasy player. um, As long as he's split up from Donovan Mitchell. Yeah, I believe so. Um, I think his, his new deal when it goes into effect next season, if I'm not mistaken, or it did this year, um, they're paying a lot for a guy to basically be that secondary um, perimeter player when he's your starting point guard. And and I don't think that's going to work out too well. So, yeah, if he can land in a spot where he would be the unquestioned he, – obviously, he'll be the unquestioned starter in Cleveland, but the unquestioned primary playmaker. And that's not going to happen in Cleveland if they retain Donovan Mitchell. So, redraft league, dynasty leagues, you're kind of hoping that Garland gets moved this summer, especially if you have him rostered in the dynasty league. Yeah, it might be time to buy low in a dynasty league, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. considering how bad this season was. But – in the hypothetical scenario that despite this kind of feeling like a pivotal summer for the Cavs, they just kind of run it back with what they have and say, Hey, we have this new head coach, whoever it ends up being, and they think we can make it work. So we're going to try and make it work. Garland just finished outside the top hundred. Where do you think he should be drafted? Like, is it kind of like a, like, I think it, I don't remember exactly what it was last year, fourth round. Mm-hmm. Is how far has he dropped? Is he still like just too good that you have to take him in by the fifth round, or is it even later than that? I think he's a little too good, you know, to let him go that far too far down the board. Like you maybe wait to like the fifth or sixth round, but I think even that would be a, a risk. Um, he'd probably be off the board by that point in a lot of leagues. So you know, we're still talking about someone who will be a starter, and while his numbers did decrease it wasn't like they completely fell off of a cliff, so to speak. So we're not talking about someone who we're now questioning whether or not they should be in the NBA anymore. So Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I think fifth round, maybe sixth, and if he returns to Cleveland with Mitchell, um, would probably be where I would kind of target uh, Darius Garland in drafts. Yeah, that is fair. And I think 
it could have just also been that this was a down year and he's able to bounce yeah. back next year, regardless of who he's playing with. And mm-hmm. I think it would help more if he was the primary ball handler, but even if he isn't, maybe it'll just, he'll just adjust and he'll work on yeah. it this summer. But the reports of him, you know, potentially wanting out if they stick with Donovan Mitchell doesn't make me feel super encouraged, but you're right. He's just too good. Mm-hmm. Um, for the front court, it's kind of the same question as you know for Evan Mobley as it was for Darius Garland. Like, are we just waiting for the split? And when when Evan Mobley is a full time center, which is I think was kind of been the thing since he was drafted, was yeah, him and Jared Allen are going to try this for a few years, but at some point, like, they're going to have to make Evan Mobley the center. That's yeah. what his primary position is and should be. Are we just waiting on that? And if so. If it happens, how good can this guy be? I think he has top 20 potential um, by himself. Um, like I said earlier, you know, we saw him in the postseason without Jared Allen. What he was able to do as a rim protector um, on defense, rim runner, two-man game on offense, when he's the only big, the only big on the floor. He can shoot three-pointers, but I don't think asking him to kind of just hang out on the outside as a four is the best position for him so you know they moved chair to allen i think they may that may be more pressing than the garland situation just because allen 20 million this this coming year and then 20 million after that for his free agency again and you're gonna have to pay evan mobley you know either an extension or you're gonna pay a lot of money in restricted free agency next summer so that's a lot of money to have tied up at the center position and you know he Look, man, Mobley is not a four. I know they they played him there for long enough, but his best position, his highest upside is as a five. So I think they're going to have to do – that may be the more pressing area to add to a, for Cleveland to address this summer. If they do, I think he's a top 20 guy in terms of p- potential fantasy value, to be, per- be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, I mean, this year it was almost a double-double per game, almost a block and a half, almost a steal per game. There's no reason to think that – plus a, a few extra minutes wouldn't hurt. I mean, he could get to like 33 minutes per game, more than a, like 11, 12 rebounds, up to two blocks over. Like those are all like I think fairly realistic things. He's not a really good three-point shooter, but mm-hmm. he showed that he's willing to take them um, yeah. and, occasion- and can hit them. Like he shot – on 1.2 attempts this year, 37.3%, which is, you know, it's a good rate. It's mm-hmm. not many attempts, but he doesn't need to be out there shooting five or six threes a game. But it opens up things on the offensive end, um, whereas having him at the four, it just it limits them and constricts them so much. It honestly is pretty impressive that Donovan Mitchell was able to do what he was able to do with two seven-footers in the lineup on offense. Um mm-hmm. So we know that Mobley has a sky high ceiling and we know that Jarrett Allen has been very good for the last few years, but I think if it were, if both of us were the GM, we'd be trading him and, you know, having Mobley be the center, but are we just kind of thinking, Hey, Jarrett Allen's probably just whether he's in Cleveland, whether he's somewhere else, he's just going to be a top 50 guy again, that averages a, like 15, 10 and over a block per game. Like that's just who he is. doesn't really matter where he is he's going to be solid. Yeah, I would say so. He also averaged 2.7 assists per game this year. Career high, I think the question there, was that an anomaly or is that something you can kind of build on, you know, if you're able to make more plays out of the short roll? Um, he had an average more than two per game at any other point in his career before this season. So I think it's fair to, to question that. But, yeah, I think top 50, he's a relatively safe option. Like, if you ask me in terms of like safer fancy options, like a fifth round pick, fourth or fifth round pick, you draft him or say like, I know this isn't the most popular guy, but Tobias Harris, like he's a relatively safe top 50 guy. I would rather have Jared Allen. because I think he offers a slightly higher ceiling just because of the shot blocking potential and a field goal percentage. But you're not expecting him to become like a second round player. You, you draft him in the fourth or fifth round. You're like, okay, that's going to be the baseline for him, and we'll build from there. Yeah, he's not – I mean, he's more exciting than Tobias Harris, but you're right, he's not the yeah, most yeah. exciting guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he's going to be – he's solid. Um, mm-hmm. 
is there anybody else in Cleveland that's kind of worth? But I mean, you'll probably, you know, have Max Juice for a few weeks at a time if he's hitting mm-hmm. shots. You'll pick up Karis Levert if Garland or Mitchell's out of the lineup and he moves into the starting lineup. It, but is there anybody else in Cleveland? Like, I guess for redraft purposes that you could see having value next season. Not really. In terms of drafting, not really. I think, like you said, we're kind of looking at streamers, uh, whether it be Levert, uh, Max Drews, or even someone like Dean Wade. Like he missed a considerable amount of, considerable amount of time down the stretch the knee injury he's someone they really like but we'll see what happens with him with the head coaching change um whether or not he will still get those consistent rotation minutes but yeah i think outside of the top four that we discussed you're pretty much looking at streaming options throughout the course of the season yeah and another guy that was good at times when he was given the minutes that you're probably not going to look at in redraft leagues, but could be a good, pretty good dynasty stash is Craig Porter jr. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. who got a contract because he was playing pretty well mm-hmm. um, for the few games that he was able to start because they were dealing with so many injuries, but barring them having injuries to Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, Karis Levert all at the same time, he's not ever going to see enough minutes for, that to matter next season. Maybe in a few years, um, he'll develop enough to be a rotation guy. But at this point, nobody else really. Yeah, I think that's fair. So we'll move on to Orlando, uh, who went 47 and 35, finished fifth in the East. I was writing their, um, I think, what is what are those called? The articles, well, the team recap fancy, articles we're doing. Yeah, fancy yeah. basketball season recap. There we go. Those things. Uh, mine on the Magic came out earlier. Um, this was their best season since Dwight Howard was on the team, which was kind of cool. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. Or at least their uh, their best record. It was still just a first-round mm-hmm. exit, which is something they've done a few times since Dwight left. But uh, lost the Cavs in seven. Um, but still very successful season after you know years of being kind of stuck in the middle and then a few mm-hmm. years just in the lottery and years in the lottery before that. Finally feels like they have something going for them for the first time since Dwight left. Um, they have picks 18 and 47 this year. And their team direction, I have them as an ascending contender. Like As this team develops, they're going to prove that they are a true contender, especially in the East, I think. I mean, had they beat the Cavs, like they, they almost beat the Cavs the first round and probably could have been pretty competitive against Boston mm-hmm. in the second round. I don't think they would have won, but... They were they did well against Boston during the regular season. Um, an elite defensive team, which yeah. you don't always see out of young teams. Um, their offense was more of the issue. But how do you kind of feel about this Magic team moving forward? Yeah, I think they're headed in the right direction. Um, obviously, this summer, you know, adding shooting to that rotation is going to be critical for them. Um, we've seen like Clay Thompson be mentioned as a potential target in free agency. Uh, they need guys who can shoot to play off of Franz Wagner and Paolo Bancaro. I think that would help, especially Bancaro's efficiency or lack thereof. That's been an issue for him. As good as he was in the playoffs, we've also seen him have some incredibly high turnover games too. So I think addressing the shooting. Um, and other thing, keeping guys healthy. You know, we've seen that with guys like Markel Fultz. He'll be a free agent. Jonathan Isaac, Wendell Carter Jr. Guys have just struggled to stay healthy. So I think – that's not really something you can really address in free agency in terms of just guys staying healthy, but the shooting and then the playmaking, those are going to be the two things for them to, to look at because this is a group that if they get it right down there, they could be a contender for a few years in a row coming up pretty, pretty soon. Yeah. I mean, the, the duo of Paolo Bencaro and Franz Wagner is one of the best young duos in the league. They have so much mm-hmm. upside, um, even though, I mean, Franz was better this year in fantasy, but Still, I felt like he could have taken a little bit more of a leap. Like the three-point percentage was also really, really down this year. So I think Mm -hmm. he gets that back up, and he's just automatically just – his fantasy value is going to go up. He's going to make more of an impact and just make more of an impact for that team outside of fantasy. Um, You you mentioned them adding shooting. It really – honestly, outside of those two and maybe Jalen Suggs, like they probably could address everything else. Like I still think that they're – 
they have a, a very deep team and like they yeah. have a couple guys that have a lot of upside. Uh, they just drafted Anthony Black and Jed Howard the lottery last year. Cole Anthony's still very good. Um, you know, Jonathan Isaac, when he's healthy, is very good. Markel Fultz was disappointing. But, you know, whether they, they're going to need to add shooting, they probably need to figure out something at center because Wendell Carter Jr. is solid. Mo Wagner is solid. Gogo Batadze is solid. But, like, is that a center rotation that's going to get it done against? I mean, we've already talked about it. The Cavs had Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. The Knicks have Hardenstein and Mitch Robinson. You know, the two teams in the finals have really good centers. Mm-hmm. Is that center room competing with that? Probably not, in my opinion. And then also, you know, would having a true point guard make things easier for Bancaro and Franz? Like, that might take away a little bit of the playmaking that they do. Yeah. But I think it opens up so much for the team and would help them improve on their efficiencies. You know, Bancaro is known for having a low field goal percentage and high turnovers. But he's been good everywhere else. Does adding in someone to facilitate for him, like how much does that help him? How much does that help Franz? I think they have a number of things that they can answer this summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would say so. I think getting a, a stable point guard in there would kind of help speed things up from a decision-making standpoint for Paolo and Franz. I think they got a little stagnant at times offensively, just trying to decipher what the defense is doing. This team that was a bottom five pace team in the NBA uh, this past season. Elite defensively, but the offense, you know, bottom third in terms of offensive rating. So that's clearly where they, they have the most room to grow. Um, but, man, I think if you can get Paolo with a point guard, I can get him in spots where he can be at his best and just get downhill immediately. I think top 100 in terms of the actual value would be more than and fair to expect from him, if not higher. You, he's someone you tend to pick in that top 75 range, I think, which I have no problem with. You just have to be realistic in terms of where he'll ultimately finish up. Like if you're in a turnover punt league, something like that, he's going to be a lot better for you than say a nine cat. So I don't know. I think, I think you make a good point about the point guard and whether or not and, and what that would do for a guy like Ben Carroll. And maybe that's the answer to our Darius Garland question from earlier. And he needs to come mm. down to Orlando, be the point guard there. I think that maybe they give up being a top three defense in the league and they drop a yeah. little bit, but they still have a bunch of really good defenders. So that won't yep. take too much of a hit, but I think that does help the offense. I mean, Paolo can probably go down to closer to two turnovers per game, just having the ball in his hands a little bit less, maybe two and a half, maybe two is a little bit too much of a drop, but that would, you know, give him easier looks. Field goal percentage goes up. I think those are probably, maybe not the turnovers. That's probably something that unless, as long as he is a primary ball handler will be an issue. I think it could be helped by a point guard, but you know, stars generally have a bunch of turnovers. Yeah, yep. The field goal percentage is something that I'm assuming is going to improve regardless. Um, mm-hmm. How much upside does Paolo have, I guess, from a fantasy perspective, but also just like a basketball perspective? Like, is he a guy that can, if he improves on the field goal percentage because he is like a a 6'10 guy that can move well and shoot the ball pretty well, like get to the basket easily, like can he get up to 52% from the floor, be a top 25 guy in nine cat? Well, the free throw percent, we'll say top 50 because the free throw percentage is never going to be great. But is he a guy that can be like a top 10 player in, in the league? Um, In terms of removing fantasy, I think mm-hmm. that's possible. Um, We've seen a lot of young players emerging, you know, especially during these playoffs. And he was one of them. Um, I'm sure some will say, well, top 10 might be a stretch. But I think the physical tools that he brings to the table make it more than possible. Um, the athleticism and, and power that he brings to the table at six foot ten, you know, just improve that shooting touch, you know, make better decisions in terms of the turnovers. I would not be surprised if he were a top ten player at some point in his career. If you think about it, two years in, he's already won rookie of the year, made the all-star team this year. He's clearly on an upward trajectory. So now it's on the front office to kind of put pieces around him that will make his job a little bit easier than it has been these first two seasons. Yeah, um, 
the his first playoff series, I mean, I think it went really, really well. He had one yeah. game where he was pretty low scoring, but they won by over 20. Um, it just didn't really matter. Like they just had a really good game. So yeah. what that he didn't play all that well. But other than that, he, like the points went 24, 21, 31, bad game, 39, 27. He had 38 and 16 um, in the game that they lost in game seven that they lost a really, really good first playoff series. Also the, his teammates didn't play all that well. So mm-hmm. like Franz Wagner had a pretty bad series. He had two good yeah. games, mostly pretty bad, but he was obviously the focus of a very good defensive team and still was able to show out. So mm-hmm. I think the upside there is tremendous. Maybe not as much for fantasy. It's always going to be hindered probably by the free throw shooting. I can't see him taking a dramatic leap there um, and turnovers. I mean, if you have the ball in your hands and you're effective with it, like there's no mm-hmm. reason for them to take it out of his hands too much to the point where turnovers just aren't an issue. Uh, hopefully they can help it a little bit, but yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit for him. Uh, hopefully we'll get some more magic games on national TV this upcoming season so that people can watch him play basketball um, mm-hmm. outside of us league, league pass fanatics <laughs> um, for Franz, the other, you know, edge of the, of the sword, the, the double-edged sword that is in Orlando, their stars, you know, he's been really good, but it feels like he hasn't been able to really like take a leap and like kind of prove it. Um, Even if he has improved from, you know, each year a little bit, it almost feels like he's too passive. And if he was more aggressive, that the numbers would go up. And do you think that's something that we see from him where, I mean, he averaged, about 20 points per game this year. Is he a guy that, hey, if we just see him shoot more, he can get to 25 points per game because he's a really, really good finisher, especially for another 6'10 guy. Um, mm-hmm. Is it something that we just need to see him shoot more? Or is it just like, hey, if he shoots his regular three-point percentage, yeah, sure, he can average 25 a game. Yeah, I think that's going to be the big thing. His three-point percentage dropped by eight points in comparison to a second season. That's a pretty steep, steep decline there. So I think that's part of it. And then, like I said earlier, this is a team that plays extremely slow in terms of pace. Um, So you have to ask, like, if you want him to get more shots, where are those shots coming from? Just because they don't play too many possessions, you know? So I think that'll be the other thing. I think he's a top, he's a top 75 fantasy player this year. I think that's a pretty fair floor for him in terms of his value. Um, but he's not someone who you expect to have an extremely high fantasy ceiling. Now, obviously that can change if they, you know, change some things with that rotation, but their foundation in terms of the defense and and the way, the speed at which they play, it's going to make it difficult for him to raise his ceiling too much unless they were to make like significant changes in terms of the point guard and then how fast they play. Yeah. And adding in any point guard that, I think would be good enough as a playmaker to get him easier looks probably is going to need a healthy dose of shots. There's yeah. only a handful that are really good playmakers that don't need to shoot a ton. Um, and if it's, for example, a guy like Garland, like he's going to mm-hmm. need, get his shots, but we'll take out uh, his brother doesn't need to shoot anymore. That's seven shots per game. Mark <laughs> took eight shots per game. We'll just take those out and give them to give them to Franz Paolo. Mm-hmm. That'll, that'll work better. Um, yeah. For Jalen Suggs, uh, was not very good as a rookie, and he, but he's gotten better every year. He was about r- right around uh, 100th in nine mm-hmm. cat leagues this year. A lot of that was an improvement with his shooting percentages. Uh, is that something that we think can stick? Uh, we, we also saw, I mean, it's a di- very different style of play, but another point guard in Orlando in Cole Anthony that last season his shooting percentages went from like 39 to like 45 and then dropped back down a little bit this year. Is that something from Suggs that, Oh, he's just kind of developed his shot and he's going to be a better shooter and, you know, 47 ish percent from the floor. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's pretty realistic. He almost shot 40% from three. Like, sure. Like that's just kind of what he's going to be. Or is he going to regress to the point where, Hey, the nine cap value doesn't look as good. I actually think it can stick um, just as important the fact that he stayed healthy. Um, 75 games played, 
but 45 is a rookie, then 19 is second year. Uh, actually, 48 and 53 is first two seasons. So being able to stay healthy, you know, you're not you're spending more time working on your craft and in the, the training room. That's a pretty big deal for him. Um, so I think this can stick. You know, I think when we talk about potentially adding a point guard or a playmaker, you know, another playmaker to that rotation, Suggs is someone who doesn't really need to have the ball in his hands too much to have an impact in fantasy. You know, it's a second team, all defensive player uh, gets after on that end of the floor. You mentioned the improved three point shooting. It's where he can play off the ball, be kind of a finisher, whether we're talking catch and shoot or driving to the basket. So I think top 100 is certainly fair value for him. I don't know if I would draft him that high per se, but if you took him like right around that 100 area, I wouldn't be opposed because I think what we saw this year is something that is easily and something that can be duplicated by him moving forward. Yeah. And I think also, um, I I think it's something that can stick. I think regardless Mm -hmm. of what they do at point guard, I'm not as worried about Suggs because I think heading, I mean, in college, he was a point guard. Yeah. Heading into the draft. I think he would expect to be a point guard. He was, almost in a little bit of an off ball role this year, even if, you know, whether mm-hmm. it was when Fultz was a starter or just when he was, I guess, technically the starting point guard. I mean, Franz and Paolo were the two ball handlers on the team. Yeah. So if they make a move for a point guard, Jalen Suggs is probably just going to be the two. And mm-hmm. that's not going to be a very different role from what he had this year, where he is harassing guards on the other end defensively and knocking down threes and 40% for three. That's, There isn't many shooters in Orlando, but if he's Mm -hmm. one of them and one of their better perimeter defenders, it's going to be hard to get him off the floor, which is great news for his fantasy value. Another guard that they have in Orlando, because, you know, they have pretty, uh, a lot of depth in their Mm -hmm. backcourt, in their frontcourt with a bunch of young guys. Anthony Black, who they drafted with the number six pick this past year, um, was not very good as a rookie. Uh, the numbers in college were really good, specifically defensively. Uh, he had a steal percentage in college of 3.4, which mm-hmm. lined up. Herb Jones had a 3.4 steal percentage in college. OG Ananobi was 3.0. Jalen Williams was 1.9. Um, Tari Eason's was higher. His was absurd in college. So mm-hmm. comparable with a bunch of guys who get a ton of steals and mm-hmm. help in that category. But you know, Anthony Black's minutes were limited, but even when he was on the floor and playing big minutes, the steals just weren't there. He averaged half a steal per game this year, which was the majority of his fantasy appeal. Like, I think he has some upside as a playmaker. The shot isn't great. It was really like, hey, like, can this guy come in here and make an impact defensively? The steals weren't there as a rookie. Mm-hmm. Do you, I don't know if you were ever an Anthony Black believer, but do you believe that he can? end up being within the next couple of years, a guy that makes an impact in fantasy, or is it already kind of looking like, Hey, maybe this wasn't the best pick. Yeah. I think he might be someone who's better suited for dynasty leagues and redrafts Um, Mm -hmm. just because of the perimeter shot or lack thereof. It's going to take some time for that to come along. Um, I think that the nature of their perimeter rotation outside of Jalen Suggs didn't really do him too many favors either. You had guys in and out of the lineup because of injuries. So I think, man, Black. I think Black may be someone, depending on how well he plays in summer league. Obviously, summer league players aren't the same as in season players. But if he has a good summer league, he might be worth taking a late round flyer on. Um, But man, I, I I really need to see more. I'd like to see more out of him in terms of the minutes because there are some games he was in the rotation, spot starter. Others when he just barely played. So, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I like what I see in terms of long term, but in terms of redrafts, uh, I'm a bit more skeptical about him going into next season. But two, three years from now, I think you'll be a, be well positioned to give them, you know, solid minutes and be on the fantasy radar in a lot of leagues. Yeah, there was games this past year when he did start and he yeah. only played mm-hmm. 20 minutes per game is one of those frustrating things where it's like, hey, the rookie's starting. Let's see what he can do. And yep. like for fantasy, it's like, oh, like keep an eye on this one. Oh, they're only going to play him 20 minutes. Well, how am I supposed to really know what this guy can bring? <laughs> yeah. um, so 
I don't know, the guard room, and that it really is every position in Orlando that they have so many young guys that are kind of, you know, next to each other that are soaking up each other's minutes. So it's hard for us to see all of them. And then they're also playing Gary Harris starter minutes, yeah. which is annoying because I don't want to see Gary Harris, even if he makes sense. Like he makes sense. Yeah. He's a good defender. He's a veteran. Like I get why he's in the rotation. I don't, I don't want to see that from a fantasy perspective. I want to see all the young guys mm-hmm. play. Um, but regardless of what they do. Yeah. I think it'll probably be a couple of years if they make moves this summer and say package, a couple of their guys, such as uh, no. Mark or Fultz is Harris, a free agent Harris and Fultz are both free agents. So that's a lot of money okay. coming off the books for Orlando. So, yeah, you know, that I think that's where a lot of your finances will be coming from in terms of upgrades that we spoke about with regard to point guard and, and perimeter shooting. So, yeah. Yeah. And honestly, for Anthony Black to see consistent minutes, it may take them losing both of them. And mm-hmm. potentially even moving Cole Anthony in a yeah. in some sort of package deal as well. I think that's the only way that Anthony Black is playing enough minutes for him to warrant fantasy consideration just for next year at this point. Still definitely mm-hmm. a guy to to keep around in dynasty, but we'll we'll see. I don't feel like Orlando should feel like pressure to make a ton of moves this summer, but there are definitely paths that they should take that could improve the roster next year and make them like an actual contender in the East after making the returning for the playoffs uh, for the first time in a handful of years and really actually kind of feeling like they have a chance to Mm -hmm. make a run for the first time in even longer. Um, They have solid pieces throughout the, the roster, but those are the main guys that I feel confident in for fantasy. I mean, Jonathan Isaac, the main question mark is, is he going to be healthy because he's yeah. really good. He's on the floor, but he's just not on the floor. It's unlike this mm-hmm. season was so much more than he has played. Like really <laughs> since the bubble, um, Wendell Carter feels like at least for fantasy, he's regressed. Um, yeah. Paul Anthony, nice sixth man, but not a super exciting guy. I don't know. Is there anybody else on this team that you would consider, even if it's just like a late round pick on like adding in a standard league? I would say Jonathan Isaac is a late round guy. Like you're not going to expect, I think one year is like a top 20 fantasy player or something like that. You're certainly not expecting that given the injuries, but he's definitely worth a late round roll of the dice because at that point in drafts, you're pretty much playing lottery tickets. You know, you're kind of hoping if this hits, you know, I may win my league and he's someone defensively, you get him for 65 games in terms of like the steals and blocks potential, he could help you win a league. So I think he's the one guy I would probably target on this roster is like a late round pick for fantasy drafts. Yeah, no, that that's definitely a good one there. Um, goodness. He was one of the best defenders in the league when he's on the floor, mm-hmm. but <laughs> it, it is good to talk about him as hey, like, he's a late round guy that has some upside as opposed to a, Hey, like, he's not worth talking about because he's probably not going to play basketball this year. Like we haven't heard yeah. anything in two years. So good to see him back playing basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's all we've got uh, for today. Raph, before we go, anything that we should be keeping an eye on uh, content wise from you? Oh, well, it, it's my turn in the uh, fantasy recap series for Wednesday and be the Los Angeles Lakers. Um so, yeah, they, they made some news recently with a potential head coaching hire. Um, so that'll be fun to kind of parse parse through. And then we also have our NBA Finals roundtable with some of our mm-hmm. predictions for the upcoming series that starts on Thursday. Yeah. Can you give us a sneak preview of it? Who do you have winning? Um, I like Boston in six. I think okay. Occasional, you know, cases of sleepwalking aside, they've been the best team in the NBA all season long. So I'm not going to deviate from that at this point. Yeah, I went Boston in five. So I'm, uh, I hope I'm wrong. I'm going to be rooting <laughs> for Dallas to win, but and in seven games. So there's more basketball, but I have, uh, I have Boston in five just because, okay. yeah. We'll let, we'll let everybody read it to get the actual analysis. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. That's going to do it for this one. Uh, you guys can give Raph a follow at Raphael J on Twitter. Uh, Raph, thank you for joining me for this. Hey, thanks for having me, Noah.
of course, at any time. Uh, but that's going to do it for this one. Um, so you guys can follow me on Twitter at NoahRubin22. And I will see you guys next time. Thanks. You just listened to another episode from the Fantasy Basketball International Podcast Network. Thanks for joining us. And for more information about joining our community, please check out our website at fbibasketball.com.